Welcome to another Ohm Town Daily News Show. Today is October 22nd, 2022. And this is the Ohm Town Daily News Show. You know, I thought I was prepared, but I'm just not. So, a uh, real quick rundown. What is Ohm Town? Ohm Town is actually a news aggregation site that's what that is right there that's what powers this show i am interested in a bunch of different topics and so i like to aggregate news around them about 50 at a time there are the 50 that are listed under these six main categories uh, create news education entertainment social and technology i hope to bring 50 channels to twitch under the ohm town umbrella uh, everything takes place within ohm town if you're interested in being a host or co-host, get in touch with me. Let's see what we can do. I've realized that I just can't do everything as one hour shows. Um, mainly because over the last year of streaming, uh, it's almost been a year. It's been 294 days that I have streamed in succession. And um, yeah, so a normal show runs more than an hour. And I don't want to switch back and forth between shows each hour. And uh, I, I typically just uh, do a show and then post it unedited over to YouTube and to the podcast. Oh, and as a side note, you may hear spooky music. Um, at any rate, let's get into today's news. Uh, one other side note is if you hit exclamation point showbot, it'll allow you to connect to omtown.showbot.tv. And if you hit exclamation point S and uh, a title or uh, a URL or something that you want to say, it'll get thrown into showbot as well. Uh, let me know if you run into any problems. I may not even see it in the chat, but. Uh, let me know if the, if you have any uh, concerns. From there, from omtown.showbot.tv, you can actually vote on the articles that you might find interesting. And I'll keep it in mind when I go through the day's news. The very first article for today, though, is in the Hatch Ideas channel. And it's uh, this eight-sided shelter made from bamboo costs about $110 and could prove lifeline for victims of natural disasters. Uh, one of the main uh, concerns with those who are, are suffering from uh, an being present in a natural disaster is safety, shelter, uh, along with food. Um, the, those are the two primary uh, concerns after a natural disaster. And um, at $108, they rounded up apparently in the article, it says a $108 home made of bamboo could prove a lifeline for victims of natural disasters. The Heritage Foundation of Pakistan has developed a zero-carbon, low-cost shelter made from bamboo. The shelters can be constructed in a few hours and dismantled and moved where they are next needed. Bamboo is an extremely fast-growing uh, product, and uh, I've had products made from bamboo, um, and they are inexpensive to say the least, yet rugged, very, very rugged. So it says here, Hurricane Ian recently left a trail of destruction in the U.S. And another reminder uh, of the damage nature can inflict on communities. Obviously, they're not going to be very robust. They wouldn't withstand a, another hurricane or a tornado or whatever. Um, but post-natural disaster or post-disaster, it doesn't have to be natural. It could be a man-made one. Uh, something happens somewhere in a city or in uh, anywhere, really and you could deploy this so this is the uh, item sam tabaridi is the author over at business insider and it's much like a yurt and if you're not familiar with what a yurt is it's basically a, a well <laughs> yurts are pretty cool tents this however um, is made of bamboo and uh, says the nonprofit shelters use bamboo which is cheap and light but also strong yes that's true and uh, there isn't really much more to say about this um, i think that something akin to a yurt um, would be fantastic 
and not necessarily be as complex as this, although it says that it can be put up pretty quick and is zero carbon, um, something like a yurt or a large tent, which really doesn't embody what a yurt is, but uh, this could offer a little bit more um, environmental control than, you know, a pup tent or something like that. You can stand up in this. It actually has a roof. Um, I don't think that you would be able to do too much of um, like a cooking kind of situation where you have a fireplace inside a yurt. You can actually do that. Um, at any rate, you know, something that's eco-friendly and can be put up pretty fast. Uh, the simplest structure has four sides for a single family and costs about $10. And there's a larger eight-sided structure called an octogreen that can be built for $110. And it's covered with reed matting and held together by bamboo pole in the center. Yeah, maybe, maybe depending on where it is, accessibility would be the leading uh, element in this. So let's move on to the next article. This next article is quite fascinating. And it is a Pez Smuggler's Remarkable Story featuring um, a new documentary. And it's ABC's new, ABC News' Lindsay Davis speaks with the director and star of the new documentary, The Pez Outlaw. I had heard about this a while back. I can't remember when it was, um, but I had heard about a, somebody that smuggled Pez um, dispensers in particular. I don't really know what it was all about. I didn't pay attention. It kind of fell off my radar, but uh, lo and behold, here we are again. This is an article that was put together by Michaela Ma, uh, Mascufo, I guess is their name. Uh, over at abcnews.go.com. Pardon me, I'm just looking at another stream of mine. Um, which, if you haven't heard of it, it's over on Twitch. So twitch.tv slash Waffleton Adventure Company. Um, yeah, I know it's a long one, but it actually has a, a, a bunch of knock-on um, world building there. Um, and over at that site, that channel here on Twitch, you can... Listen to some chill music, and which isn't streaming right now, the music, um, it's switching. Um, but um, it's my sand table is running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At any rate, back to this uh, article, Pez Smuggler's Remarkable Story, featured in a new documentary. The film is about Steve Glew, G-L-E-W, who made millions smuggling Pez dispensers. On the list of strange ways to make money is a career is a career path that's hard to make up a Pez smuggler. I know it's shocking, but that really is what they did. Smuggled Pez smuggled Pez dispensers. In 11 years they earned 4.5 million dollars according to the article. And then they recall um one single shipment of Pez dispensers worth $500,000. Smuggling dispensers from Eastern Europe to the United States. That's pretty fascinating. Glue would acquire Pez dispensers directly from the European factory where they were made and sell them to collectors in the United States, in some cases for thousands of dollars each. A restaged incidents. Pardon me one second. Not sure what just happened to me. Um, the film also covers personal aspects of Glue's life, including his financial struggles and his mental health. I don't know, with $4.5 million, it shouldn't have any financial troubles, but mental health, maybe, having to smuggle stuff. 
People need to talk more about what they're going through, he said, adding that they try to teach people to talk, not to lock it up and not to hide, which that would be the probably one of the main issues in this um, documentary about mental health. So give it a give it an investigation, the Pez Outlaw. And it's a new documentary. I don't know where all it's going to be um, streamed from. I'm not sure. Just do a search for the Pez Smuggler because they don't have any obvious links in the article. This next article is scholars found a long lost star map from ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus hidden beneath layers of medieval Christian text. I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Museum of the Bible, Early Manuscripts, Electronic Library, Lazarus Project, University of Rochester, Multispectral Processing by Teeth T. Keith, sorry, Teeth, did I say Teeth? Keith T. Knox and Tracings by Emmanuel Zing. You'll see the picture here when I switch over. Scholars discovered the oldest known star map beneath the text of a Christian manuscript, according to a new study. The long lost catalog was developed by Hipparchus sometime between 162 and 127 BC. The ancient Greek astronomer made the earliest known attempt to chart the entire night sky. And researchers believe they may have found a fragment of that long lost star map compiled by the ancient Greek astronomer. So let's go over to the article. Uh, Paolo Rosa Aquino over at Business Insider put together this article. um, And this is the uh, graphic that I was trying to, that I was highlighting by uh, citing the source. It's a yellow tracing show the coordinates of what is believed to be the ancient Greek astronomer Hipparchus's long lost star map. And it shows that there's writing underneath the writing, which is apparently underneath the writing of others, um, all uh, Christian manuscript writings. And um, in a paper published in the Journal of uh, for the History of Astronomy on Tuesday, scholars described discovering what they believe to be a 2,000-year-old segment of a star map. The text of a Christian manuscript was written on top of the star map, uh, which was drawn on medieval parchment. The Christian text came from Egypt's St. Catherine's Monastery and is now in possession of the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. Hipparchus's star map, which is... Uh, developed sometime between 162 and 127 as the astronomers attempt to record accurate positions of celestial objects with fixed coordinates. Pretty fascinating. Um, Apparently this is where it was found. St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt. Yeah, it's kind of a shame that we have lost things from antiquity Uh, For one thing, one reason, one rationale, one whatever you want to call it or another, it doesn't really matter. It's just that knowledge is lost. Um, Many a time it's to protect uh, the truth from being known um, or the historical record from actually being accurate as per direct witness and not perceived from storytelling after storytelling it says the new evidence is the most authoritative to date and allows major progress in the reconstruction of Hipparchus's star catalog a study authors wrote in addition to compiling the first known star catalog Hipparchus is created with uh, being the first person to observe the earth's procession meaning how it wobbles on its axis as well as the first to develop accurate calculations about the motions of the sun and the moon, which can pretty much land you getting, well, deleted, as I call it nowadays. Um, Let's move on to the next article. I've got about 12 today, maybe, I think it is. I'm not quite sure. I just just found articles that I thought were interesting. Um, Let me me just go through them, and if you are interested in... Uh, talking about something feel free to throw in uh, some words here in in the chat 
Abbott Nutrition plans a $500 million infant formula manufacturing facility amid continued shortages. The company is in an earnings call and said that it would, it would uh, also made leadership changes at Sturgis, Michigan's um, baby formula manufacturing plant, as well as in its quality organization following the shutdown and nationwide recall that exacerbated formula shortages nationwide. No, 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 no. Let's let's throw this where it really needs to be thrown. This is not exacerbated by formula shortages. There aren't enough baby formula manufacturing companies to lower the price and keep quality and competition high. That's the problem. There isn't enough margin. Why? Because you have to have $500 million to a billion dollars just to get a new factory up and running. This is actually quite demonstrative of that fact. Abbott Nutrition plans $500 million infant formula manufacturing facility amid continued shortages. People are buying baby formula and selling it on the black market, gray market. Uh, you know, they're selling it publicly. Not as if it's a drug or anything like that. They're basic, but they're charging more for it. And guess who needs it? Mothers. Society. Not exploitive scumbaggery. We're moving forward with plans for a half billion dollar. This isn't something to brag about. This is a national disgrace that we don't produce enough food for infants. This isn't something that should be bragged about. Anyway, in a new U.S. nutrition facility for specialty and metabolic infant formulas, company chairman and CEO Robert Ford said on an earnings call. <clears throat> so this call was actually uh, listened in on, and uh, Nathaniel Wexel is the author over at The Hill that put this article together. Feel free to go and check all the rest of this out. But it says we're currently in the final stages of determining the site location and we'll work with regulators and other experts to ensure this facility is straight state of the art and sets a new standard for infant formula production. We recognize there's more to do, but feel confident in the progress we're making. <clears throat> yeah. So th the way that they're talking about it is for specialty and in metabolic infant formulas, but that's techno babble because all formula, okay, if you aren't breastfeeding, then you provide formula. And unless this is some subset of the formula that's on the shelves, then I don't know what this facility is actually producing because all uh, all formula disappeared during the pandemic because somebody screwed up production and it somebody saw hey let's <laughs> just like gpus except that lives are on the line and everybody says no 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 you cannot make formula on your own and it's actually discounted again and again. You can't make formula on your own. Well, the problem is we can't rely on companies because it's exploitive. It's, it, it's too costly to rely on some corporation whose motivation is entirely profit to stakeholders. Let me rephrase that stockholders, because if it was for stakeholders, every mom in this country Every dad with an interest in their family and every family orbiting around a child would be sitting there and anybody with compassion and, and a moral compass, all of these other people that are sitting there saying, you can't do this should be raising hell about this as well. Adults can multitask, you know, sort of. Humans can't multitask. Let me rephrase all of this because I need to make it abundantly clear to anybody that knows who I am and how I talk about things in the public. Um, this included is a forum for which really the truth needs to be said. Humans can't multitask. We have the ability to do 
multiple things at different times, <laughs> but we don't multitask. Okay. Anybody that argues differently, there's anomalies, but humans don't multitask. We do fast switching. I'll leave that alone and move on. Okay. So let's get into this next article. Apple watch helps discover a 12 year old's rare cancer. When I first thought about this, I was like, what in the world could this, how could this have possibly happened? But, um, I know that the Apple watch has triggered other people to investigate something that might be going on. So I assume that's what's going on here. But it says here, a young girl's family credits Apple Watch's uh, heart monitoring features with saving her life by helping to discover cancer rarely seen in children. And the article is over by um, Apple Insider. Where did it? Amber Neely is the author. And there we go. So neuroendocrine. Um, is a, a, a type of cancer. It's called a neuroendocrine cancer. Um, and it says Miles' mom, Jessica Kitchen, took her to the hospital where doctors diagnosed her with an appendicitis. And during the procedure, they discovered a neuroendocrine a, a tumor. Uh, in her appendix, which is rarely seen in children. And the doctors learned that the cancer had already spread to other parts of Miles body. Uh, she had surgery at CS Mott, um, without getting too far into it. Basically the, um, the heart monitor part of Apple watch, um, kept on detecting an abnormally high rate. And that's what made mom take kid to the hospital and so yeah that's how it works folks um and if you have any question about that kind of a thing and you're not wearing an apple watch you should get an apple watch um, i monitor my heart rate um pretty much 24 hours a day no real particular reason um, i am fascinated by stats and so I have a tonal and I try to work out and, and monitor everything. And, and basically you need to know where you stand and you can't find that out easily. Um, statistically, you can wake up one morning and go, oh, I have aches and pains, but that doesn't amount to much. So uh, start tracking your health and you might be surprised by what you find. So let's move on to the next article. And that is in the wanted channel. And oops, pardon me one second. Um, this next article is Johnny Ives successor, uh, Evan Evans Hanky, or some other pronunciation therein, uh, leaves Apple after three years. She's been sitting in the post of hardware design lead once famously held by Johnny Ive. Prior to taking the role, Hanky reported to I for several years. Since 2019, she's reported to Jeff Williams, Apple's chief operating officer. She manages do dozens of industrial designers at the company, whereas I've once oversaw both industrial and software design. Hanky's responsibility was on the hardware side only. Apple's head of software design, Alan Dye, will remain in his role, according to sources um, that spoke with Bloomberg. Hanky announced her departure this week, saying she will stay for six months while Apple works out its future plans for the industrial design team. So I'm curious why somebody would leave. No replacement has been named. Um, Samuel Axon over at um, ArsTechnica.com is the author of this article. And um, she's not publicly stated what her next move is her role was also held for a short time by designer Richard Howarth or Howarth in 2015 to 2017. Hanky took it on around the time of Ives departure from the company just three years ago. And Howarth is still with the company and could be a candidate to replace Hanky. Who knows why? 
it'll be interesting where they end up if anybody pays attention to that kind of thing but are there going to be substantial design changes fundamental design changes coming because the person steering the industrial design is now leaving i don't know uh, there's definitely um, a rule book to the design at apple and who is currently designing that rule book um, this next article is uh, a leak suggests he could be is going to be entering the video doorbell space which could be fine Ecobee is a company best known for a line of smart thermostats. I've looked at their thermostats and considered it. Um, I'm kind of burnt out on the Nest. Um, it loses its connection uh, to the network with the frequency of a cheap ham radio. Um, maybe it's my fault, maybe it's not. I tend to monitor my network um, quite, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and I only have two things that disconnect from my network with regularity, and that is the Nest thermostats. I've got two of them. Um, and uh, my Hunter fan uh, disconnects with even greater regularity. In fact, I would say that the Nest does not disconnect with any regularity. It's rather random. Um, and I think it's because it has to go through uh, Google something <laughs> something going on with Google anyway um, Ecobee is um, apparently getting into the video doorbell space a leaked image from that's not funny shows what looks like Ecobee branded video doorbell with rounded corners and a button outlined in blue um, I will take a look at it once we uh, follow the link it's over at the verge as noted by Zat's Not Funny, the doorbell features a green light status light. Okay, a green status light, maybe. Um, as well as two small holes, one of which could be a microphone placed directly beneath the camera. Its overall design seems to glean elements from existing doorbells on the market, such as the bright blue light used by the Amazon-owned Ring and Blink. So let's click the link. <laughs> you know, it actually looks more like a, an original... Um, ubiquity light uh, doorbell uh, than any other that I've seen um, but anyway let's see aside from this one picture they don't have much else about the device including whether it'll be wired or battery powered please don't let it be battery powered that means it's gonna have sporadic video retention um, and it'll over overwrite whatever motion isn't detected. Like whenever motion is detected, it'll take a couple of seconds of recording and overwrite the last one, unless it has cloud built into it. Uh, the batteries have to be recovered or recharged again and again and again, depending on the traffic. Um, I've had people contact me about their Arlo's. Oh man. Anyway. My nest. I had a ring at one point. I had another one from another brand. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'll evaluate this when I see it, but I'm considering switching my thermostat because I want more reliable uh, internet connectivity to it and I want home kit connectivity, which the nest does not. Uh, support in terms of um, thermostat but my my um, video doorbell is now um, both local and cloud-based recording um, so that I am never disconnected from recording in high resolution and it records much, much more and doesn't cost me anything. I do not have a subscription fee anymore. Ask me how if you're curious. Um, there's still no word on when Ecobee could release this rumored doorbell and the company didn't immediately respond to The Verge's request for comment. And earlier this year, Ecobee launched its first, or not its first, it launched premium and enhanced smart thermostats. We'll check those out. 
Anyway, this is over at The Verge by Emma Roth. I failed to let you know where it's from. Um, let's go on to the next. This is uh, the second to last, the penultimate um, article. And it is... Pardon me one second. Let me do this right. There we go. Okay, so two men have been jailed for using SIM swapping to steal crypto worth $330,000. Again, this is probably... Whenever I hear about somebody stealing something, it's usually very large when it comes to crypto. In this case, it's pretty small time. Um, two Massachusetts men were jailed for taking over social media accounts and stealing cryptocurrency holdings um, by using an illegal technique called SIM swapping, according to the Department of Justice. So they just went straight federal. Um, Eric Miggs, 24, of Brockton, and his accomplice, Declan Harrington, 22, of Beverly, were both sentenced to just over two years for SIM swapping, computer hacking, and other techniques that allowed them to steal crypto. Um... Sam Tabar Haridi is the author of this over at uh, Business Insider. Two lawyers told Insider how to protect against a potential attack. Two-factor authentication probably would do it. Um, if a victim has two-factor authentication for those services enabled via SMS confirmation, then the fraudsters can satisfy the authentication challenges because they will receive the SMS code sent to the victim's number. Yep, that's the if they have just the two factor telecommunication companies may be liable for SIM swapping. All companies that gather and retain private information have a duty to protect your data. Your phone provider should have robust identity verification uh, procedures, you know, depending on what it is. So how to stop it. They say, um, Freund advice, uh, one of the attorneys, I guess, uh, advise contacting your cell network and activate or request all available account security features. AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon offer additional PIN codes you can require for any transfer or reporting of your phone number. Yeah, so two-factor would solve it if it weren't for weak, lax service um, in the telecom company. Uh, this makes it easy or less likely that a fraudster could successfully impersonate you uh, to your carrier. Both Ochoa and Freund said suspected victims of SIM swapping should contact their network immediately, reset their passwords, notify their banks and credit card companies, and contact police. The sooner you act, the better your chances are. So the only way really is to notify them. It, it should fail closed anyway. That should already be in place. You should already have a PIN in place. You create an account, you generate a PIN. I've got other secure accounts that have that already in place by default and you can't even turn them off you have to have an impossible to recover pin yes security causes friction but i'd rather have a secure account than lose three hundred and thirty thousand dollars but two-factor would have solved this problem if not for the telecom company fail open Let's move on to the next article. Just the request, the request to transfer the SIM would have, should have notified the account holder by email and or by not and or it should be and by SIM. And like it should just go SMS, not just not SIM SMS. Anyway, the last article for today is Apple starts selling front door lock that can be unlocked by tapping an iPhone or Apple watch. So I've um, already spoke about this lock once before. Oh, what is going on here? And um, it, it came up again because this is saying by tapping an iPhone or Apple watch, and it's because it uses Apple Home Key, but you can buy any HomeKit powered um, lock 
and control it much the same way. It just won't be a tap. You'll have to open either the Apple home interface um, or the application that powers it and click on the unlock button. Like I can unlock my front door using my watch. This person's name is Kiff Leswing. Or Leswing, I'm not sure. Um, they're over at CNBC. And that lock that I was referring to was the $329 level lock plus. Um, it's pretty snazzy. Um, I kind of dig it. I might swap mine for it. Who knows? I don't know. I'm not really a big fan of actual physical key locks. If it has a key lock, then it can be opened. And if there's any suggestion otherwise, go watch the lock picking lawyer on um, YouTube and you'll see just how easy it is to unlock anything that has a key. <laughs> Uh, so Apple stores in the U.S. are now selling an exterior door lock that can be unlocked by an Apple Watch or iPhone. Um, and uh, pretty much anything that allows for Apple Home Key, that's it shouldn't be. I don't think it's limited to just Apple Watch or Apple Phone or iPhone, I should say. Um, the Level Lock Plus is the first Home Key supported lock that's been sold in Apple stores. So subtle flex there for the level lock plus i think if you were to take a uh, another lock and just charge 329 dollars that might qualify for placement within the apple store if the margin is good enough for the apple store um for apple it's a milestone in the development of a highly anticipated feature that was first announced in 2021 the home key is an example of apple continuing to digitize stuff that's normally carried in a physical wallet or pocket uh, from cash to keys um yeah they're they're extending as much as they can into the digital domain uh, to get rid of the physical products that are out there physical media is pretty much dead i say this to people all the time and uh, there's no doubt about it that uh, keys and cards and cash um and many other things paper in general is gone um movies and music and books and everything else can all be digital and um, and but on the problem is instead of lowering the cost for these things because the entire engine behind distribution of all of these things is physical space doing away with them makes it instantaneous transfer and so it should be cheaper, but it's not. What gets translated into is a bigger margin, and that's where we end up. So um, with all that in mind, uh, I am done for today here at Ometown and Ometown Daily News Show. I will see you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Come on by. Have a chat about past or future articles. And we'll talk some more. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.